So most of the time they put acknowledgments at the end, but I have to admit I'm going to start with them because a lot of people help with this. So just for some of you uh, who don't know, uh, Dr. Arruda, uh, grad student uh, Greg Stevenson, is doing very well. For those of you who've heard of his condition, um, he's, he's much improved. And then Dr. Yoon, of course, is the classical virologist. So thanks to them for all their uh, help with putting this together. And this is our outline. We're just going to talk about rotavirus, the pathogen, um, some of the diagnostics that we're seeing uh, through, the, through the VDL, and then finally, what's the, um, what's the immunity and prevention like with rotavirus? And there's a lot of unanswered questions there, so I do apologize, I won't have the answers, um, but at least I can give you some information that maybe you can go home with uh, to help in that process. So as background, rotavirus is a major cause of diarrhea in most species. So humans have rotavirus, calves, pigs, um, dogs, cats, you name it. Um, but rotavirus, they all have a species that's specific for rotavirus. Um, the neat thing about rotavirus is that, you know, the swine rotavirus or the human rotavirus or the calf rotavirus is only specific for that species. So we we're only dealing with a couple things there. So that's nice. And it's generally, just like everything else, confined to the small intestine. So we're only dealing with uh, duodenum through ileum again. The issue is, though, that rotavirus is everywhere. Uh, it's almost all farms are positive. Uh, intensely ra raised uh, production sites, larger sites, they're going to have a very high infection rate and low mortality. It's basically, if you wanted to find it, it's pretty easy to do so. Rotavirus is basically in every sow farm that's probably under management or seen by everybody in here. It's just, it's just that common, okay? About this virus, it's, it's kind of cool. Um, again, I'm a quasi-virologist here, but it's a non-envelope virus, different from PD, PED, which is an envelope virus. A non-envelope virus has a little bit of different structure to it, and therefore it makes it more resistant or more hardy to uh, disinfectants and desiccation. So that's part of the issue. It's more resistant to environmental degradation. The other thing that makes rotavirus very challenging, and I think you guys are realizing that as we step forward and new do new, have new diagnostics, excuse, excuse me, is that it has 11 double-stranded RNA segments. So they're all separate. So think of influenza, right? That has eight RNA segments. Uh, rotavirus has 11 double-stranded uh, RNA segments, so they're all separate. So therefore, it gives it the opportunity, potentially, to swap some genetic material if they infect the same animal at the same time. That's kind of cool. Now, here's where it's going to start to get a little bit tricky, and hopefully you can stay with me. Rotavirus has a three-layer capsid. All right? There's an outer layer. A middle layer and inner layer. That's pretty simple, right? Three layers, one, two, three. Outer, middle, and inner. Now, there's separate proteins that are on each layer. The VP4 and VP7 are the outer proteins. The VP6 is the middle protein, and the VP2 is on the inside. Therefore, when we look at this virus, we actually break it down into groups, which you probably know very well from getting diagnostics back. We diagnose it as A, B, or C. Well, they're classified by A, B, or C based on their middle layer, the VP6. Okay, does that make sense? We're just taking a portion of that capsid out and saying, okay, is this A, B, or C? That's how, that's how we get that um, diagnosis for you. Technically, there's actually seven different groups of the VP6, but only uh, five infect swine, A, B, C, D, E, and H. E and H have not been reported, to my knowledge, in the US, so we're only, or North America, we're only dealing with um, A, B, and C when it comes to production systems here uh, in the US. So for a schematic for you, if this, this is easier, uh, VP7, outer right here, and VP4 is this kind of like spike looking thing. Those are the two outer ones, the middle one's the blue, that's VP6, that gives you the A, B, or C, and then we have our inner inner layers before we get to the uh, RNA on the inside. So pretty simple structure, but the structure then causes a lot of problems when it comes to immunity. And I just want you to remember this 
three-layered concept when we, get, when we start talking about that and prevention in, in, down the road here. So we just said that A, B, and C are identified based on the, on the VP6 gene, and the E and H have not been reported here. When it comes to immunity, though, the VP7 and the VP4 have the highest antigenic uh, capacity, meaning we really want the VP7 and the VP4 antibody response to be very, very high. All right? They're on the outside. If we take care of those or neutralize them prior to infecting us, or if we neutralize them, they can't infect a cell. So that's what we're really trying to do when, we, when it comes to immunity is actually get high amounts of uh, VP4 and VP7 antibodies produced. A little bit more on the pathogen. Rotavirus A, which we're classically known to have, was first discovered in the 70s. Um, it's very easily grown on cell culture and we can detect it by multiple ways. So you name it, IHC, virus isolation, PCR, pull down electrophoresis, you know it. If you can name it, we can probably detect it on a rotavirus A. Rotavirus B and C, on the other hand, are a lot different. They were discovered a little bit later. They are almost impossible or very, very, very difficult to grow on cell culture. And that has made the testing or known testing very difficult to do. We didn't really have a PCR for either A or B or sorry B or C until most recently. There's not really any other tests either. There's not an IHC because uh, we can't find the antibodies or we can't grow this virus to get specific antibodies to test for it. So that's the difficulty behind it. I do want to throw out two things. And this is kind of confusing, so I don't mean to uh, we'll take it slow. But it's, I think it's good information for you guys to know because it helps us with this presentation. Uh, okay. Rotavirus A can be further broken down into G and P types based on the VP7 antigen and the VP4 antigen. And basically what that's trying to tell you is, or when they do that, is it's giving you a new serotype. So you can have a rotavirus A that is a P type, I'm sorry, a G type 1, and you can have a rotavirus A that's a G type 2. I'm just giving you an example. And there's no cross reactivity for immunity. So the outer membrane, the VP4 and the VP7, play a huge role in immunity, and it's very specific. Everybody's giving me the blank stare. I know this is kind of I know this is kind of hard, but we have this big category of rotavirus A's, but there's a whole lot of A's underneath it that are, that are just sitting there. They're all different. Just because it's an A doesn't mean it's the same A. Is what I'm trying to tell you. We think that is the same for B and C, but we don't actually know at this point in time because we can't really culture it. University of Minnesota has been doing some. Uh, sequencing and most likely there is very similar to A there's genetic diversity in the VP7 and VP4 of both B and C viruses so potentially there is different serotypes which means different immunity to those rotavirus specific isolates questions on that because that is totally confusing and once you grasp that concept this is a whole lot easier presentation does that make sense to everybody? Just because it's an A, B, or C, it's, there's multiple ones under each category. That's, that's the take-home point. All right, so what do we know about group A's in general? They're very highly prevalent. Nearly almost 100% of pigs or sows actually have antibodies to rotavirus A. When you look at diuretic samples from previous reports, um, this is the swine book, anywhere from about about two-thirds of the animals with diarrhea, you will detect a rotavirus A, just in general, post-weaning. B and C, we do not know those numbers because basically the PCR has just been developed and we, no one's done the, sorry, the, 
the surveillance uh, of, of feces with PCR to determine how prevalent is B and C within the population that we deal with. It's likely very common, just like A, but we, we can't say that at this point in time. The other thing that um, we need to understand is just because you make a, antibodies or infected with rotavirus A doesn't mean you can't be infected with B or C at the same time because they're technically different viruses antigenically. So there's lots of combinations that can be occurring in a neonatal or post wean pig at one particular time. It's just not one virus, it's likely multiple. So the pathogen. Let's talk more about the infection chain. Um, basically, it's a fecal-oral transmission, just like PED. And just like PED, it attacks mature enterocytes, destroys them, shortens villi, and you got fusion, and therefore reduced ability for that piglet or that animal to actually absorb the feed. You get a malabsorptive diarrhea. Well, part of that is complicated a little bit by all the milk proteins and so forth, and that draws more water um, out into the lumen, and I get even worse diarrhea. The other interesting fact about rotavirus is that it actually has a toxin, uh, NSP4 toxin. I really don't know a whole lot about it, but potentially it's very similar to the heat-stable B, I believe, or heat-stable A of uh, E. coli, adding to uh, cause more diarrhea in, in certain instances. Can anybody see that? That's a piece of intestine that's in a serum tube with formalin in it. It, and we'll wait for Ned here to kill the lights. But this is an easy test that you can do on a farm. It's just literally just a baby piglet. It's about an inch long section, and I put it in a tube. And, oh, that's great. Can everybody see the fingers? That's what a normal intestinal villi should look like. It takes about 30 seconds for that piece of intestine to do that. All right, that's nice. Basically, a lot of a lot of uh, absorption area for, for nutrients to com come across uh, the lumen. This is what it looks like microscopically. We've seen this picture earlier. It has a lot of long villi um, and so forth. Well, what rotavirus does is it attacks mature enterocytes like we talked about. And basically, here there, here's the virus in, those, in that villus tip. And basically what you start to see is these enterocytes that are starting to swell and basically produce a lot of rotavirus antigen, and they're just, just expanding, 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 and pretty soon they're going to burst, that cell's going to die, and all that rotavirus new particles is going to enter and pass through the intestine. So that's kind of the pathogenesis of it. Um, and just like PED, if you get lucky and get at the right stage, you have almost all your mature enterocytes being positive. Typically, what's the turnaround time uh, for infection? This is 18 hours uh, post-infection, where you have probably the most 18 to 20 hours, similar to PED, where you have maximum replication post-infection in a, in a naive, naive piglet. So there can be just as many virus particles being produced from PED as there can be from rotavirus in this particular instance. And results here. Um, villus fusion and atrophy, and there's our normal just to give you a comparison. So we just talked about that earlier. It does the exact same thing. Uh, neonates, it's much more severe, as we talked about, because of the mature enterocytes. post wean pigs, uh, not so bad, because only the tips of those villi at post wean actually have mature enterocytes on them. Okay? Yeah, and that's, and that's what you guys see, right? We just kind of talked about this, the, the baby piglets um, having more, more mature enterocytes. And by day seven, it takes about seven days for that, that enterocyte at the bottom of that crypt to get to the top of that villi. That's the normal progression. Uh, so seven days, basically, uh, post-birth, um, the, the virulence of a rotavirus is, is pretty much pretty low because uh, those cells have, have reached uh, maturity at the top. What do we see? Um, basically, the most of the time, the most prevalent infection is three to five weeks uh, of age. It can, but can range from a one day old to adults. There's no age specification to it. You can be infected with multiple groups at the same time. So you can have an A, 
a B or a C all at the same time. But also, what is the most interesting fact that we can't test for uh, routinely is that you can be infected with different viruses in the same group at the same time. So you could have two or three A's at the same time, or two or three B's at the same time, or two or three C's at the same time. You could potentially have, you know, you get a, you get a diagnostic report back from us that says you got rotavirus A, B, and C in there. There's not three viruses. There could potentially be 12 or 16 or 7. We don't, we don't know. We have no way to, to, just, to test for that for the different viruses. So there could be quite a few specific isolates in that, um, in that feces at one time. I was going to say uh, one thing about this, and it, you know, it comes back to that GMP type based on the VP4 and the VP and the VP7 uh, combination. If I was to only take a rotavirus, a single rotavirus isolate, and put it in a pig, generally it's about two to three days. Probably, on average, it's probably more like four to five in, a, in the field con um, scenario. Is it longer in co-infections? Potentially, uh, but not necessarily. It could be just the same amount. Other issues, though, that we have to realize that cause problem with this, as we learned about earlier, is, is potentially feed transitions. Because a feed transition will actually cause your intestine epithelial cells to change as well. So it could make it shorter or longer. Um, diet changes, environment, you name it. Um, Ingredients, all those things play into the severity potentially of a rotavirus based on, <clears throat> excuse me, the maturation of enterocytes going to the top of the villi. So that's kind of the virus in and of itself. Um, very confusing. Just remember, there's multiple types and there's multiple different potentially serotypes in each group, which gives it causes problems. Right now, we're going to go through some diagnostics and tell you what we're seeing at the at the VDL before we all fall asleep. And I hold you from your first beer that's in your hand. So Iowa State Diagnostic Laboratory, what do we get? What do we see? Um, if I break it down by caseload and so forth, basically we have a fourth, 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 and fourth. Um, ends up being fourth of the cases are pneumonia cases that you submit, a fourth are diarrhea. Basically the fourth is kind of everything else, and a fourth is just samples that get the PCR test run them. So it might be just feces or it might be just oral fluids. Uh, something to that effect. So if you break it down, basically, in one of four cases that walks in the door it is a diarrhea case. Now if I break that diarrhea case down even further, what's the percentage of pathogens that I can find in that sample? <sighs> the biggest one here, rotavirus. In about a third of those cases, we will detect rotavirus um, samples. The other ones, we do get PERS in a couple of those cases, but anyway, if you break it down, um, that's what we're finding. Salmonella is quite high. Yes, uh, we do find that quite a bit. So what I'm trying to say is it's very common on the samples that you submit. Here's what it looks like over time with rotavirus and other pathogens put in there. Um, just want to clarify some things real quick. Most of the other pathogens that we're running pretty steady, but I just want to, those red lines starting over here is our rotavirus diagnosis. If you watch that, we're just, we keep climbing. We keep, we keep climbing. Now, part of that may be due to enhanced testing or the ability to detect more different viruses, but also there's a trend of what we're seeing in caseload, too, of the more cases being affected by rotavirus. This is just another way to look at that. I think the important part to remember here is just the difference. Look how, look how high we've risen. Um, just in the last two years of the number of rotavirus cases that we are diagnosing um, through the lab. So with that, we can tell that you guys think it's a problem, and we're seeing it as a problem as well. So now we need to do some research to figure out what's going on. Is there something we could do to prevent it? Is it an immunity issue? What is it that's causing this diarrhea in these neonatal pigs? Or why is rotavirus so common, I should say? I'm going to break this down a little further for you because this is the interesting part uh, for me. If I was to take all these cases of rotavirus and break them down, how many just have one virus in there? Or one group, I should say. How many have two groups and how many have all three groups? 
Well, most of the time, one group is about 42% of the time. We get two groups 18% of the time, and about 5% of the PCR positives. We detect all three at once. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty common. And here's the most interesting part. I was going to ask you this question, but I forgot to take that little circle out before I hit the button. C is by far and away the most common that we are actually detecting. So everybody has vaccines. We've had A around for a very, very long time. But when you break it all down, rotavirus C appears to be the most common isolates or group that we're detecting. If I break that down even further into different groups, by age, if I just took Take group A rotaviruses. If I break them down by age, less than seven days, 8 to 20, 21 to 42, and greater than 42, we can see that, yeah, it's common, less than seven days of age, but the most common is post-weaning. If we do it with Bs, we get an almost equal distribution among everybody. It's pretty prevalent no matter what time frame that we're picking it up at. And finally, if I take group Cs, that's the most striking one. Over 50% of the type C's that we find are always less than seven days of age. So can I ask a question on that? Why do you think type C is more common in neonates? If we're feeding back and doing everything correctly, why is, why is type C there? Why not type A or type B? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just asking because it would. What's the difference? Why wouldn't it be an equal distribution of everybody? Why wouldn't it be B, because we vaccinate for A more often, or A's in the vaccines, and we potentially some people use those. So I could see A being less, but why all of a sudden B? So why why is it just C? Why don't we see a lot of B? I, I don't know. I was hoping someone would have an answer for me. <laughs> um, if I break down age combinations, so if I took how many times we find A and B together, how many times we find um, B and C together, how many times is A and, B, A and C, or all three, that's what you're looking at. By far, in a way, the most common is post-weaning because you're mixing pigs, right? You're mixing litters of pigs that potentially one cell had a type C, this cell had a type B, and that cell had a type A, you get them all together, post-winning diarrhea, bada-bing, we get type A, B, and C all together. So that's probably what's happening, but on a, on a, on a bigger scale is why are we having such poor luck on immunity um, to these non-group A rotaviruses in the ferrin crate, I think is the bigger question. So if you look at the data from, from summary here, I think the biggest thing um, to note is post, uh, group A viruses, yeah, are more common post-wean. Group Bs, yeah, we see those kind of mixed in. But Cs, they're the most common one week, less than one week of age, and we do find co-infections quite frequently. So with that, then, we got confused at Iowa State going, okay, we're getting all these different types, we're getting all these questions, is one more virulent than the other? I mean, or is, they just, or is rotavirus just a rotavirus? Could that be it? I, I, I don't know. So we decided to actually do a, a little study that was funded by the Pork Board. Thank you very much, National Pork Board. And our main goal was to compare viral titers, shedding, and microscopic lesions between different groups. So it's kind of confusing, but basically we had pigs. We either inoculated them singularly with a group A, B, or C, or all their combinations thereof. And then we kill them at 24 and 72 hours later to see what, what the lesions would be. So if you really want to know, there it is. All groups, six pigs in each group uh, with appropriate age match controls. And these are CDCD pigs, by the way. So no colostrum. Let's see if there was any difference. Hmm. Probably don't need to mention this, but we did our best we possibly could to make sure there was no cross-contamination. Each pig was housed in its own brand new uh, little tote. Uh, we did um, challenge them gastrically 
had about five hours, and they were fed uh, three times a day milk replacer. So uh, we did that as best we could to make sure we met the nutritional needs. And then what we collected was uh, fecal swabs every 12 hours, and then killed half the pigs at 24, and the remaining at 72. And basically we were looking at five different sections of intestine to note the extent and the duration, basically the extent and the severity of microscopic lesions to try to determine if there was something different between the groups. So the results. Basically negative control stayed negative. That's good. Um, singular infected groups, all groups A, B, and C, no matter what they were, didn't have diarrhea at 12 hours. 50% had diarrhea at 24, and almost everybody had it at 48 hours. Very similar, no matter what the combination was, we found that no diarrhea at 12, yes, 50% at 24, all of them at 48, but the severity was a little bit more striking uh, with the emaciation and dehydration if you got multiple groups together. So here's um, just our serial prevalence of fecal shedding by time point. Group A's, at 12 hours post inoculation, if we had just a group A, we didn't have any pigs shedding. B's, we had 50%, and C's, we had 83%. By, four, by 24, um, there you can see this as we go here. So what I'm trying to show with this, basically summarize this little table is, that it appears that A took a little bit longer to get going. B's were there early, but then kind of was not too hardy of a virus, it appeared like. But C's, they started quick and they kept going. They lasted a long time. So potentially why we're seeing more C's, this is a theory, hypothesizing, um, some of these C viruses may have genetic information that gives them a longer severity, uh, potentially, or, or longer duration of disease. I don't know. The other interesting fact was that we found that there was differences microscopically of what was going on with these viruses. And basically A's and B's, the A and B virus that, sorry, back up, the B and C virus that we used basically infected enterocytes along the entire intestinal tract from duodenum to ileum. Didn't matter where it was, the whole tract was infected. Versus the A isolate that we used appeared to skip the duodenum, or the early part of the small intestine, and basically infect only the last half, so jejunum and ileum. I wish I had an answer for you why that occurred, but we could definitely find the answer that appeared that our A virus was not as sturdy and it had a very location dependent, where the Bs and Cs were more diffuse, potentially then creating more environmental contamination, potentially, because they'll be shedding more of that virus uh, once the cells burst. A little neat information there. Will it hold true for all C viruses or all B viruses or all A viruses? Hard to tell, but um, there, there's likely probably some viral uh, isolate differences. So sum it all up. All groups caused diarrhea. didn't matter which one it was. Um, viral shedding, some differences, but it may be isolate dependent. Basically, what we found was C was more consistent and B was very inconsistent. And we just, we just said about the enteritis where A's more distal small intestine or group B's and C's were more diffuse. So where are we going with this now? Uh, that's a great question. We got a couple more grants to understand what the difference is, maybe um, longer duration of shedding to see if, if pigs have an A virus longer or a C virus longer. Potentially that's why um, we're getting more environmental contamination potentially in a ferrin crate. That's why we're seeing C's more often. I don't know, but there's definitely an issue with why we're finding more C's. And I think you guys know that as well because um, there's multiple different uh, companies and so forth that are actually trying to make their own uh, C feedback by infecting pigs and, and feeding back to, to sows to compensate for not having a vaccine. Um, I'm going to be honest with you and say I wish I knew the results to all that stuff, but I don't. We see them a lot come through the D-Lab. Um, but they're trying unique things to get going. With that, 
we're going to jump into the immunity and prevention of rotavirus. And this, I'm glad it's the end of the day and there's beer next, because this is kind of a sad story. It's kind of like a country western song. Real quickly, in the suckling pig, how immunity works. This is very important. In general, when there's rotavirus in the environment, colostrum and milk antibodies are neutralizing. Meaning, if that pig is suckling enough and often enough, when it's intaking feces or organic matter that contains rotavirus in the crate, that colostrum will bind to that rotavirus and prevent it from entering the cell, thus decreasing the chance of infection. Therefore, immunity of the dam is very, very important because she's providing all that prevention. So the more often the pig suckles, the less likelihood that it will actually have succumbed to um, rotavirus disease if the antibodies are present. Yes, colostrum is important too, um, but those IgGs that are absorbed are not the main portion of immunity. They do get absorbed early in life. Sometimes they get excreted back out. But the most important thing is, is, the serum, or is the neutralizing antibodies that are being bathed at the same time. So you're preventing that rotavirus from attaching. If you remember earlier, I told you that the, v, the VP4 and the VP7 are important for that neutralization. If those two don't match up, it doesn't matter if you have antibodies in there. If they're not neutralizing that specific isolate, it's still going to affect the cell. How immunity works is that there is a systemic and local response. Antibodies are made most often to the VP6, the group antigen, but that's not sufficient for protection because it's not preventing cell entry. So the VP4 and the VP7 are by far and way the most important. And therefore, also what's interesting is we get to that G and P types again, because if there's differences in that, it doesn't matter how much you have in there. If, they're, if they don't line up, it doesn't happen. So the best example I can give you is it's very similar to influenza. What we know about influenza virus is very similar to what we know about rotavirus when it comes to immunity. It's got to be pretty homologous. Otherwise, it's not going to work. That's as plain and simple as I can make it for everybody when it comes to immunity on that. So there is no cross-protection between different groups, A, B, and C. There is no cross-protection between different zero groups, meaning different P and G types within the A, B, and C virus. So if you take anything away from this presentation, it's right there in black and white. Only protective against a single rotavirus isolate. There's not broad immunity, and it's very, very specific. So in a sense, when people are doing sow farm feedback to use uh, piglet inoculation to get that stuff, that's a very good way because it's very specific because it's coming from that farm. Um, if they're, then that's kind of the most important aspect of it. Um, there is some other things we can do for prevention. Obviously cleaning. Uh, is, is important. It appears that bleach is the best disinfectant to kill um, rotavirus, potentially. That's what the books say. You can vaccinate, but again, it has to be specific. I'm, I'm not, I don't promote vaccines of any sort. I know that multiple companies are trying to get different um, rotaviruses, uh, group C's together. Uh, I do know of a company in Ames, it's a small one, that uses the VP7 sequence to try to do this. We're just in the midst of determining whether that's actually going to work or not. So um, there's lots of people working on it. I'm sure everybody else in this room has ideas on how to prevent it. But again, it comes down to very, very similar to influenza virus. It's got to be very specific. So the question is, how do you do feedback and you need to do it well? That's basically what it comes down to and you need multiple pigs with di potentially different isolates within it. The other important aspect is, you know, good quality colostrum 
immunity helps, but basically you want to make sure that those piglets or those sows are milking on a frequent basis to help bay that intestine when it comes to rotavirus. I do wish I had better answers for you on the immunity aspect, but the more we learn about this virus, the more challenging it is to try to determine if we can actually come to a, a resolution on, on the isolates that we're seeing. Can we do it? Yeah, we just need, like everybody talked about, good sanitation, all that good stuff. Um, but when you're doing immunity and feedback, potentially your vaccines, you really need to look at what viruses you're pulling out of the farm and how you're giving that to the piglets. I would challenge you, though, not to take one isolate all the time. So if I take one, one litter of pigs and I get a C out of it, is that the one that's the same C that's going to protect everybody? Potentially, you may need to take multiple Cs or multiple different litters and use all of those Cs as a, as a feedback or use in, in generating some uh, material to get back to sows. There are a couple other ones um, that's, that's, that's going on. Uh, most of the commercial ones right now are just type A, but like I said, we know, what's, we know that um, multiple other companies are probably working on them. But I look forward to seeing how we can do this uh, with, these, with these challenges. It's going to be an uphill battle. It's basically we need to provide at least some immunity to, to suckling pigs, at least when it comes to rotavirus type C. Now the question then comes, well, if all these pigs, these sows, or these growing gilts actually saw rotavirus type C when they were piglets, how come they're not immune to it and our replacement gilt should be passing immunity to those next generation of piglets? Duration of immunity is probably one thing. The other thing that you don't know is when you actually pig goes through a grow out, it's probably infected with about Oh, Dr. Janke did his PhD on this um, way back in the 80s, and there's a lot of good information that was never really published. But 10 to 12 different rotavirus type A infections within a nursery phase that can occur all one time. And so basically a nursery pig is being infected with multiple different types of ro rotaviruses over time, mostly A's. And so their immunity is probably pretty high and pretty, probably pretty broad versus the other types, which potentially have lower numbers of isolates and are not seen as often. So partly, I believe that duration of immunity is there, and partly it's probably because of vaccine and what we're seeing. I wish I had more answers. I don't. But if, if we can help, I mean, literally, it probably feeding back is probably the best mechanism we have right now, but it's also determining what's actually in there. It may need multiple isolates to actually make it be uh, efficacious in multiple situations.